Well, good morning, everyone. I'd like to add my welcome to those you've already heard, um, and also to vouch for Gadsby's Tavern. Um, I, uh, as, as you were talking about it, I had one of those flashbacks. Um, when I was a senior in high school, my father was in the military, and he was transferred and stationed at the Pentagon. And for my senior prom, my date took me to Gadsby's Tavern. So, <laughs> so it is truly a historic landmark. <laughs> um, I uh, really am uh, pleased to, to be able to open um, your uh, 39th uh, annual uh, Nutrient Data Bank Conference. Uh, I thought I might start by giving you a little bit of an overview about what I do at, at the department and kind of orient you as well to the role that we play in the U.S. Uh, Nutrient Data Bank. The mission area within the department that I have responsibility for is called research education and economics and within that mission area are four separate agencies. Uh, the Agricultural Research Service, which as you all heard in Donna's slide, um, has played a, a very major role in the planning for this conference. And, and more than that, over the years, has been the, uh, the, the brains behind the creation of our National Nutrient Data Bank, as well as um, the source of much of the data on food composition that is goes into that database and also sponsors research um, to continue to add important uh, new substances in food that have bioactive properties uh, to that database. Um, the second uh, agency, also an intramural agency of the department um, that is important for nutrition is uh, the Economic Research Service. And as its name implies, it does economic research. There are approximately 300 economists working in ERS. And among the program areas uh, within ERS is one that has responsibility for um, analysis related to program delivery uh, in our food um, assistance programs, uh, as well as uh, major responsibilities for analysis, again, with an economic uh, perspective, of the, uh, the entire food supply in, in the US. Um, the third agency, also an intramural agency, is uh, the National Agricultural Statistics Service. And as its name implies, they do surveys uh, and also every five years a, a census of agriculture in which they attempt to interview every single farmer in the United States. Their work provides uh, enormous amounts of information about annual food production uh, at the beginning of a growing season, what farmers intend to plant. Um, at the end of the growing season, the actual yields and the projections as to how much of the major as well as minor commodities will be produced in the United States. And their work is very important for two reasons. One is, um, their data informs a lot of the program and policy decisions that the department makes about our farm programs. But secondly, their data is also important to the commodity markets. And uh, so their projections of what food production is going to be in the United States have big economic implications, both in the US and in international markets. 
The fourth agency is the National Institute of Food and Agriculture, uh, which is an extramural agency, a grants-making agency, that provides funding for university-based researchers uh, in, uh, among all of the, the agricultural and, and nutrition and food science disciplines, competitive grants, to support their work. And uh, NIFA also provides formula funds that go to the state agricultural experiment stations as well as to support agricultural extension. So again, a very important role both with respect to nutrition and food science research that's done in universities and also to supporting our public education programs delivered through cooperative extension. Over on the right hand of the slide is a block that says Office of the Chief Scientist. Um, I have a second title and a second job within the department that was created in 2008 when Congress um, created this title of Chief Scientist and said that the Under Secretary for Research, Education, and Economics is also the Chief Scientist of the department. And from the role of the chief scientist, it has created a responsibility that is actually department-wide uh, to establish the priorities for our research programs across the entire department, uh, as well as our science policies that govern the work that we do. So uh, over the last several years, we've been working very hard on issues of scientific integrity and creating our policy for the department uh, to maintain the integrity of the science that informs all of the decisions that are made throughout the department. Uh, and I've also had responsibilities for implementing our open data policies, which I'm going to be talking more about today. So that's just a brief overview of, of what uh, I do and uh, the scope and, and range of the agencies that are in this mission area, REE. Um, in 2011, uh, President Obama issued a directive to all of the agencies and all of the departments uh, to accelerate technology transfer and to commercialize federal research in support of high growth businesses. Um, this is what's also called an executive order. The president issues a lot of these, you know, to agencies to get us to coordinate our work and, and to promote some of the things that are of particular interest to, to the president. So in, in this case, um, in this directive, President Obama said, I encourage agencies with federal laboratories and other research facilities to engage in public-private partnerships in those technical areas of importance to the agency's mission. Certainly, our nutrient data bank, virtually from its inception, has been a public-private partnership. It has had to rely on work, good working relationships with the private sector in order to populate the database. Uh, but uh, in response to this presidential memorandum, um, we within USDA put together a plan about how we were going to implement this directive to have uh, even more influential public-private partnerships. And within the 32 initiatives that we identified that we were going to undertake, there was one directly relevant to this conference. And that was our 11th initiative, Enhancing Translation of Nutrition Science from the Bench to the Food Supply. Um, we said in that that uh, we were going to direct our attention uh, to developing public-private partnerships with the federal science agencies and the food industry to translate research outcomes into the food supply. And one of the most visible of those initiatives has been a partnership for public health that's focusing on bringing into a reality a branded food products database. This has been a, uh, a dream for many of us for many, many, many years. And uh, the goal that uh, we identified in this partnership was to enhance public health by augmenting USDA's National Nutrient Database 
with nutrient composition of branded foods and private label data that would be provided directly by the food industry. Uh, as with the nutrient data bank, the data will be publicly available. Uh, it certainly is going to have a lot of use within the nutrition survey activities as well as the research activities from our intramural programs. But more importantly, this database is also going to be made publicly available for use by the scientific community uh, and, and the food industry. And it also can be incorporated um, into proprietary databases uh, and you developed by end users. Um, two of the speakers following me, uh, Dr. Pam Stark-Reed and Allison Kretzer, are going to talk more about uh, this initiative. Uh, and so I'm just giving you a little teaser at, at this point. Uh, but I, I am really thrilled that this uh, database uh, partnership has moved as far as it has and is on the cusp of becoming a reality. Uh, this is also an example of the data revolution, uh, a worldwide movement that's underway to make data available for public use. Uh, this worldwide movement really is focusing on making data that's co uh, collected by governments uh, and in the private sector uh, open, uh, accessible, uh, and uh, useful. And open data is expected to generate new insights, uh, drive better decision making by all of us, uh, and enable governments and civil society and the private sector to better target our interventions and programs. Such open data will also improve service delivery, spur innovation, strengthen accountability, and create whole new kinds of value and growth. So entrepreneurship is ex one of the expected outcomes of providing more access to government and other sources of, of data. Increased availability and more effective use of research and programmatic data have the potential be to become very powerful drivers towards achieving the global sustainability goals or the SDGs, and countries including the US have adopted open data policies and are creating the infrastructure to make available at no cost the scholarly publications and underlying data that are the result of the public investment in research, along with many administrative data sets that are collected by the government agencies. So within USDA, we've established a, a database that's called PubAg. So all of the scholarly publications that are the result of the federal investment in food and agricultural research are going into PubAg. Uh, and this is a widely uh, available and searchable. And we are in the process of building an associated data bank that will be called the Ag Data Commons that will be the repository for the data that uh, underlies those scholarly publications. So if there is not already a, a designated database where those research data are being um, input, uh, they will reside within the Ag Data Commons. A rich data infrastructure is emerging with data from everything from the field level sensors up to remote sensing from satellites, from the genetic sequencing of crops and livestock and their disease and pest species, and through supply chain and the agricultural marketplace. We have sophisticated analytical tools and algorithms that are also being made publicly available to analyze those data sets and focused public-private collaborations to address the world's nutrition security problems are going to be needed to unlock the potential of these open data sets that are being made available. I think the food composition data uh, here in the US as well as in many other countries from the beginning being made publicly available and accessible 
is a good indication of how, as thought leaders, we've been in the forefront of open data long before we even use the term open data. Uh, but I think there's also a lot of work that we as a nutrition and food science research community need to do to, to be developing the framework of open data for agriculture and open data for nutrition security. So we need to be thinking about that framework that we would like to see as well as the priorities that we would like our governments to pose uh, as they make data sets open. So we're all familiar with the challenge of feeding 9 billion by 2050 and uh, the need to increase agricultural production globally uh, nearly double. And open agriculture and nutrition data really, I believe, are a powerful tool for long-term sustainable development uh, for improving economic opportunity around the world, and, and particularly for farmers uh, in uh, developing countries who are smallholders, and contributing to the health of, of all consumers. Uh, we're familiar as well with the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, there are several that uh, have reference to uh, improving food security uh, and uh, nutritional status. But the sustainable development goal number two, I think, is the most relevant for our discussions today. And its goal is to end hunger, achieve food security, and improve nutrition, and promote sustainable agriculture. Uh, open access to research and to the uh, underlying data are vital resources for food security. Um, and the use of open data at the institutional, national, and international levels can benefit innovation in agriculture and food science and nutrition, helping people to grow and consume more nutritious foods. Major funding bodies uh, in the agri-food and nutrition research areas are making open access mandatory requiring research outcomes and research data produced through their funding to be made publicly available. And that's the case in the United States. Globally, there's a growing political will to address the sustainability of agriculture and nutrition through open data and open access within the different international policy research development and private sector communities. And uh, later this month, I'll be going to the fifth meeting of the Agricultural Chief Scientist that's being held in uh, Xi'an, China. And uh, at that meeting, we will have further discussion of these global research collaboration platforms that include global access to scholarly publications and global access to the underlying data. So I challenge all of us uh, to think about open data as a global public good, vital to promoting sustainable development and critical to achieving the sustainable development goals. Uh, there's an economist, uh, Paul Samuelson, who's usually credited with uh, coining the phrase uh, public goods. Uh, it was uh, first used in a paper that he published in 1954 that was called the pure theory of public expenditure. So he t coined this term public goods and he defined them as being something that is both non-excludable and non-rivalrous in that it does not, it, an individual cannot be effectively excluded from using the good where use by one person doesn't reduce the availability and the use of that same good by another person. So a global public good has come to mean a public good that's non-rivalrous and non-excludable and available to anyone uh, throughout the world. Um, I'd like to introduce you, if you don't know it already, to a, a relatively new organization called GODAN, Global Open Data for Agriculture and Nutrition. Um, it was launched a little bit over two years ago uh, when Great Britain had the presidency of the G7 countries. And it has grown now to be an organization with over 250 members that include countries, uh, include private companies, 
includes non-governmental organizations uh, like the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN, uh, universities, uh, and uh, even individuals uh, who share a common purpose. And that is to make data that is relevant to agriculture and nutrition available, accessible, and usable for unrestricted use worldwide. Uh, the initiative focuses on building high-level policy and institutional support for open data, both in the public as well as in the private sectors. And GoDan encourages collaboration and cooperation among existing agriculture and open data activities. So it's not looking to duplicate anything that's going on, rather to serve as a forum and a marketplace where ongoing initiatives can find other partners and, and, and make each other aware of the fact that they have ongoing activities in the open data space. Um, so Godin uh, welcomes everybody who shares this purpose, and I would encourage all of you here uh, to go home and, and look at the Godan website, which is listed at the top here, godan.info, and determine whether your organization um, would like to become a member. It's very easy uh, to go to the website and to log on and to indicate that your organization uh, shares this common purpose of making data available, accessible, and usable. Uh, also on the website is a publication that came out uh, a year ago, uh, joint publication with the Open Data Institute in the UK that's titled, How Can We Improve Agriculture, Food, and Nutrition with Open Data? Uh, and it gives uh, about a dozen um, case studies uh, from developed and developing countries of where open data has, has made a difference. <laughs> Lastly, um, we're planning the first uh, summit meeting uh, for Global Open Data for Agriculture and Nutrition in September of, of this year in New York City. Uh, it's going to be held on uh, the margins of the, the UN General Assembly meeting and uh, it's being planned jointly by the governments of the US, UK, and Kenya along with the One Campaign uh, and if you're not hip, that's Bono's uh, organization. And uh, an organization, uh, and I, by the way, I'm not, so I had, that had to be explained to me. Um, and uh, an organization called PUSH, Presidents United to Solve Hunger, which is also a relatively new organization that's gaining a lot of momentum globally. These are presidents of universities that are committing the resources of their universities to solve hunger problems on campus, in their communities, in their countries, and, and globally. Um, so we're really excited uh, to be, uh, ha have been appointed as the lead for the U.S. government in helping to plan this, this summit meeting. There will be uh, more information forthcoming on the GoDan website with details about the conference. And uh, I would expect that there are probably multiple uh, participants in uh, the Nutrient Data Bank Conference that might also want to be participating in, in the summit meeting. There will be opportunities for um, exhibits as well as networking opportunities uh, during the summit meeting. So in closing, um, I think this uh, Nutrient Data Bank Conference um, is exemplary of the commitment in the nutrition and food science fields to open data that uh, is, is a historical commitment and one that, uh, as I had said earlier, really is exemplary of kind of the forefront thinking about how open data can uh, be a, a, an asset in the, the research uh, community um, I'd like to challenge all of you, though, to think about that framework of what are the priority data sets that for nutrition and food science should be made publicly available if they currently are not. Uh, what are the kinds of questions that we think that open data 
for food safety, food science, and human nutrition could be benefited by open data sets. And then working together with us um, to get the political will to actually make those data sets open. Um, we are very much at USDA working collaboratively with all the agencies exactly to do that. But it really does help when you get organizations like this Nutrient Data Bank Conference coming forward and saying, these are our priorities, and we would like to see you work them into your plans for making data sets open and accessible. So thank you very much for the invitation to be part of your meeting. I hope I'll see you in September uh, in New York City. Uh, and uh, Carol, if I can take a couple of questions if, if you've got time. We... Thank, you. Thank you, Kathy, um, for your wonderful remarks and uh, the vision uh, that's uh, being given by you to USDA for nutrition. We really appreciate it. Um, you've been such a leader in the nutrition area over your career, over the number of years, in terms of uh, databases, can you uh, reflect back and, and talk about what you think have been the best accomplishments collectively uh, that people in the audience, as well as many others, have contributed? Uh, you've talked a lot about challenges as well, but what do you think is our biggest challenge for the future? Thank you. Uh, okay, so um, first of all, to the to the databases, um, it's really interesting in these international discussions. There there are a couple of things that come up as major barriers or hurdles, um, and that's putting aside. It actually takes some investment of time and resources to make data sets available and, and open. So we're, we're, we're taking the financing off of the table. But the other um, big questions that come up are privacy and intellectual property. And uh, on, on the privacy side, um, each country um, does have different regimes, you know, in, in legislation or in regulation that relate to protecting the privacy of individual responses. Now, it's not so much an issue with the Nutrient Data Bank, but it is with the nutrition surveys that are using the data uh, to estimate intakes, for example, or exposures. Um, and the approach that we've taken on, on privacy in the, in the U.S. is that, you know, all of these open data sets have got to have built-in protections where there are personal identifiers to protect that information. And our expectation is that other countries um, when they're making their data open and available are going to also, for their regimes, build, build those in. Um, we've also been having discussions with the Agency for International Development, which is actually working on a policy with respect to data sets that they will be open where there are personal identifiers for people who are not U.S. citizens. You know, this is work that's being done abroad. So they are in a consultative process right now to develop those protections that will be applied in, in, in their data sets that they will be, be making open. Um, on the intellectual property side, there's the same issue. Um, so there are different regimes in different countries. And uh, our expectation is at this point in time that each country, as it is making its data sets open, is going to be uh, incorporating into the, the work that's done um, the protections for intellectual property that are appropriate to, to their countries. Um, we're not at this point engaged in a global discussion about those you know, is there a global agreement um, that we would be abiding by? Rather, we're focusing on making sure that countries are 
uh, reflecting and abiding by their individual country's uh, regime. So those are you know, a couple of the hurdles that, that we have with, and challenges um, with, with respect to open data. Um, the third is less relevant to our interests, but it relates to national security. And you know, any data sets that uh, would put national security at risk, of course, are not going to be made open and publicly available. So those are those are the third protected um, category. Um, so uh, reflecting back on on my own experience. Um, and I know there are a number of people in the audience from CDC and from the National Center for Health Statistics, but we actually went through that whole uh, experience of discussions about protecting uh, individual identifiers when we started making all of the NHANES data sets open and publicly available back in the late 1970s, early 1980s. So, in the statistical community, um, the same is true within NAS. Um, there have very long been protections that have been put in place to um, make sure that the personal identifier information is, is not made available. So, so that's um, some of the, the challenges that, that we've had. And also because we've been successful with the survey data, I think it can be also I implemented with, with, the, with the research data. Um, and then on looking forward, um, I uh, am very much interested in this question of um, sustainable diets and sustainable food supplies. And I think there's a lot of work that we as a science community need to be undertaking, working with people in other disciplines who are doing a lot of these big models on uh, climate change and what their implications are going to be at the national and the, and the regional levels about sustainability of the food supply and the, f the, the, the nutrient composition databases have actually got a, a role to play in, in that when we can get the models to a level of actually getting off of what are now basing all of the nu nutrition findings on the four major cereal crops, wheat, rice, corn, uh, and soy. So we need, we need to be developing much better databases that will help to inform the full array of crops and livestock, and then building those into these climate change models. And I think that'll in turn be providing us with information about better planning for long-term sustainable health-promoting diets. So that's the kind of big challenge that I'm thinking about when I'm challenging you to what is the framework for open data in the nutrition food science realm that you can help us create. So thank you all. Appreciate the invitation. <laughs>